Ça marche Oui, ouais. ok. Ok, so why uh, are we interested in DSLs? Well, I think the main reason is that they give users ways to express themselves in a notation that's tailored to their domain. That's reason number one. So it means you can have better abstractions, you can have potentially fewer errors because you express yourself in a more natural way uh, from uh, the language and, and, and terminology of the domain that you're used to. And sometimes it's also a more concise and a, and a cleaner notation or clearer notation. Uh, the other reason why DSLs are important is that they give us they allow us to use new implementation capabilities that are not available in the full language. And they're actually the uh, capabilities stem rather from a restriction rather than from an addition. So you can say, express yourself in new ways. That means I somehow add stuff to maybe the host language uh, if it's an embedded DSL. Whereas if I want to say, well, if I want to exploit domain-specific knowledge for, let's say, achieving higher performance, then it comes from a restriction of the DSLs that I can, I can be, need the assurance that certain things that would be problematic in that mapping do not happen. So that's the other reason for using DSLs. And we might be interested in that for uh, the purpose of higher performance. So that means that sometimes we want to get more parallelism and standard compilers, they have to be conservative because they have to essentially predict uh, side effects and aliases and things like that. And by essentially eliminating that, we might get higher performance or we might actually be able to map to something that the normal compiler doesn't map to, like FPGAs or databases or essentially platforms that people don't usually uh, associate with a programming language. So if that's the goal, then uh, essentially you have a tree of decisions that you can do if you're implementing a DSL. Uh, so the first decision to do is uh, to make is whether the DSL should be external or internal. So an external DSL is a standalone language and then you need essentially a toolkit of uh, uh, syntax analyzers, uh, type checking uh, if, if there is uh, frameworks and code generators to actually make this happen. And hopefully that tool set is embedded in an IDE so that you get the other tooling uh, as well, and not just the base compiler. And the other very popular, I think if you look at the speakers here at the school, more popular uh, variant is internal. That means you use a host language and you embed your DSL as a library. So a DSL is essentially nothing but a library in a host language. Then if you made that decision, and uh, I think uh, nine out of 10 speakers do here, <laughs> so there's one talk by Elko today about the external way to do DSLs, and I'm very happy that you have that as a way of balancing the rest. If you do the internal, uh, go the internal route, then essentially there's still the question, what's your main goal? Is your main goal a new domain-specific syntax? Uh, or is your goal essentially a new implementation for something that already exists? Uh, we will learn about embeddings uh, in these things. So if you go for a new syntax, then typically people use a so-called shallow embedding. That means it's just a library. They just define these things as libraries to be called like any other code in the, in the, in the host language. Whereas if you want to do a new implementation, then often you're interested in a deep embedding. That means you need to so have some introspection into the structure of the code that uh, essentially gets written as a DSL because otherwise you can't optimize. If you have a new implementation, if that's your goal, then again, the question is, do you want to do that to essentially have a standard execution of your program and you want to get better performance, like supercomputing, let's say, or uh, your goal might be to say, well, I want to really use my DSL, my embedded DSL, uh, as essentially a uh, notation for a, a new target, some execution on a new target, being be it a database or uh, uh, hardware or things like that. And we'll see examples of both in the school. OK, so Scala has proven to be a fertile ground for, being, for building DSLs. Um, and I think um, that's mostly because Scala is very much influenced by this talk by from Guy Steele, Growing a Language, who has seen that talk. Quite a few, okay. So, uh, so Growing a Language, I think, was a great talk, only Java wasn't a great language to expose as a, a, language, a language that would follow this principle, because Scala isn't really very growable. But Scala definitely is, so Scala has a fairly modest core, but then people build all sorts of stuff with it and take it into 
domains that uh, essentially I have never thought of and many people have never thought of that this would happen. Uh, so that was sort of an accident that Scala, because we want, I wanted to have a language that's very library oriented. That means there shouldn't be a lot of primitives in the language, but we wanted to have <coughs> features for composition and abstraction in the language, and then the primitives would be modeled as libraries. And of course, then people took it further and they built a lot of DSLs on top of that. Uh, the other reason uh, is uh, why Scala is popular is that the ecosystem also now provides many tools for building external DSLs, things like parser combinators, uh, macros, and things like that. So there's a lot of things that can happen uh, to write both internal and external DSLs. So for the internal DSLs, Scala is uh, quite useful because it has a very flexible syntax. So it means you can mold your syntax the way you would like it to be in your DSLs. It has a very flexible type system. So it means you can use types for quite a lot of uh, things that uh, you want to express in your DSLs. It has user-definable operations. Uh, so you can have user-definable operators in your DSLs, high order functions, implicits, and so on. So it makes it relatively easy to build a new DSL on top of Scala. And where this fails, you can always use the still experimental macro system. And if we look at what has happened, then in f indeed there have been lots and lots and lots of things that I would consider DSLs built on top of Scala. So uh, if you look at the essentially the syntax extension languages, they're sort of all, uh, all these here, here at the bottom, and the uh, 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 new targets, faster, imp faster implementation languages, they are over here. So if you look at the uh, syntax extension languages, there are things like uh, the, um, the testing libraries, Scala tests and specs. So that's testing frameworks. And they specifically use Scala's flexible syntax to have a sort of very fluid, uh, fluent style uh, test specification. You, ca you can say, well, this thing should uh, satisfy this predicate. And you do it all, can do it almost as if, as if it was prose. So that came very early on. Uh, then there are database connection frameworks that essentially map uh, uh, four expressions to databases. Uh, there's Scala Z. Uh, Scala Z is essentially uh, categorical programming with uh, very heavy on the Unicodes, uh, so sort of lenses and banana style uh, things. Uh, and it expresses a lot of the sort of the categorical uh, Haskell like uh, things in, in Scala. Shapeless is something that takes us even further to essentially type level programming. Uh, Spray and Akka are uh, libraries for uh, uh, distributed computing, HTTP, HTTP dispatch, and here full distributed computing with actors. Dispatch is another HTTP library. SPT is sort of interesting because SPT, you can see it's, it is a DSL on top of Scala, uh, and it has quite a got a bit of new syntax, and some people would argue strange syntax. We'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but it's also, in a sense, a new target, because it's, it's not there to execute a Scala program, a normal Scala program. It's there to essentially define a build. So you could say, well, that's not what you normally do with a programming language. So I would classify that as a new target. Then uh, over there, we also have Spiral, essentially for high performance uh, uh, algebraic functions. Uh, we have Spark, which is probably the most successful Scala DSL. So Spark is essentially Scala for uh, Hadoop, uh, big data computing. And it's, uh, I will show, it's really nothing but a, but a, but a, but a Scala library. It's, it's nothing but a Scala DSL on top of it. There's Chisel for uh, essentially hardware construction. We'll hear more about that one and follow on work to Chisel. And there are the OptiX family of languages from uh, from a Kuhnlitz group in Stanford uh, uh, and uh, also here at EPFL that essentially uh, express, uh, use uh, lightweight modular staging to express uh, domain-specific languages in a number of domains from collections to databases to machine learning. And these, these over here, I would say, they just use plain Scala, uh, whereas over here you have some sort of syntactic extension. Of course, that's a fluid thing because all of these things are Scala, but you can you, you say, well, it depends to what degree languages we define new operators and new ways of doing things that are sort of not standard in Scala as you see it normally. OK, so in that sense, we could say, well, ph phenomenal success. There has have been a huge number of, uh, in part, very successful uh, DSLs built on top of Scala. But in fact, uh, Drawable is not always good. It's a double-edged sword. Uh, 
Uh, so Crowbill is great because it does not presume that the language designers know everything a priori about the right way to program. In that way, it's essentially the opposite of the philosophy that, let's say, Go espouses. The Go designers know exactly how you should program, and they give you very, very precise rules how to do that. And a lot of people like that a lot, because a lot of people are less worried about their own freedom to program, but about all the other people that might do something wrong in their team, and they want very strict rules and guidelines to be set. So in, in that sense, Growable is exactly the opposite of it. it Growable says, well, I will not prescribe you how you write your code. I will let you grow it in the directions that you want to. Uh, but that has also challenges. So the, the first challenge that we have observed quite um, strongly in the Scala community is that it really can fracture the user community. It gives you different dialects that different users then use, and uh, the users then often end up not talking to each other anymore, because essentially they are on this thing, Scala plus DSL here. So a person using essentially Scala in a way with Scala Z, Scala Z would actually have a very low opinion of the persons that use Scala in a more object-oriented way, and vice versa. So that can give challenges, and that's essentially society challenges that you have here. Uh, the, the other problem that we've been facing is that, well, no language is liked by everyone, and uh, that holds for uh, programming languages, main, mainstream programming languages, of course, but it holds even more so for DSLs, because typically DSLs have been designed with essentially less care and less experience than a full language. A full language matures over 10, 20 years, a DSL is, is typically something that gets, has to get done much faster. So uh, there's, there's often disagreement about essentially the DSLs that you have in a language. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, that's the set of challenges. I will talk a little bit about, what, uh, about the successes. So here's what I think is a quite phenomenal success. So that's just a, a part of Spark. Uh, typically, I think it's a word count query. Uh, we, we won't have time to go through that, but just to see what it does. So essentially, you see here, there's a map, uh, and uh, it's something that's pretty readable. It's a flat map followed by a flat map that essentially gives you a, uh, 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 what does it do here? Uh, it gives you a word and a path, followed by an, another map, followed by a reduced by key, and so on. So these things are immediately recognizable for a Scala programmer. They know what map and flat map is. And it's true, reduced by key is new, but that's essentially a tiny delta to learn, and that's something that they, uh, probably we should backboard to the Scala collections libraries, because it's actually very useful. And that means that people can immediately apply their knowledge and they can take it to a new domain. That means they can write programs on top of Hadoop. And if you compare to that to what it was before, uh, like with essentially the, these really heavy Java classes that you had to use, that that was a liberation. People said, well, now I know what's going on and I can use this also in the REPL. I can just use it in interactively and fire up uh, dozens or hundreds of nodes and have my query run there. So that's the good parts. So the bad parts or the difficult parts in DSLs are, I think, uh, come from several directions. Uh, the first one is the Lisp curse. Uh, who knows what the Lisp curse is? Uh, not, not very many. Okay. So the Lisp curse is uh, essentially the, the observation to say, well, Lisp was is a, a great language and has, has been around for a long, long time, since 1960s. Why has it never taken over? I mean, it was clearly better than all the alternatives for a very, very long time to, to, to in, in programming language history. And uh, there was actually a, an interesting analysis by Rudolf Weinstock, who said, well, the power of Lisp is its own worst enemy. So what does it mean? So he gave us an example to say, well, you have a language, and now you want to add object orientation to the language. That tells you about when, when that article was written. It was when object orientation was still hot. Uh, in uh, C, it would take somebody like Bjarne Straustab to, to, to do it. And he does it, but then essentially there's a lot of effort. He would have a lot of help, and it would be a really good implementation, and it would be well documented, and then everybody would use that, that implementation because there's no, nothing else. That was, that was it for object orientation. In Scheme, adding object orientation is uh, uh, an, an exercise for, uh, for a typical course, second year course or something like that. A student does it. Uh, and uh, it's super easy to do it, and the 
problem then is that everybody does it, and everybody does it slightly differently. And essentially, you don't get the the uh, momentum behind any one of these proposals to actually take over. So sometimes, actually, being too easy to add uh, to your language, to extend your language, is a problem. So the the r summary here is to was to say that Lisp is so powerful that problems which are technical issues in other programming languages are social issues in Lisp, and that's actually I think that's very true. So a lot of the issues in programming language design and where it goes in the communities are social issues. They're not they're not that much technical issues anymore. Okay, so. Back to Scala. What's the single thing people have complained most about Scala programs? What is the one that they, 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 they all get super excited about and mad about? Well, I think it, it's here. That's, that's the one that fired them up most. So it was a, it was a dispatch library. And this, this thing was actually meant as a joke. So where they had a periodic table of operators. Um, uh, so it's an, it's an HTTP dispatch library, and here you see all the operators. And I think they're all quite consistent in the way they, they're structured, so they have been essentially put into this periodic table. I guess here, who would, who would think this is ridiculous and one shouldn't do this? Okay, quite a few, okay, some of you. But the public at large thinks this is outrageous. This is terrifying that you should have something like that, and this just shows how completely broken your language is if you do something like that. Because there are all these strange operators and you don't know what they are. And the fact that you need a periodic table like that shows how bankrupt this whole thing is. So that's just the, the, the thing that, uh, that was actually in a talk by Rod Johnson, the uh, creator of the Spring Framework, where he essentially gave a talk saying Scala has to grow up. And that was the primary example where he said, well, this look, you can't do these things. This is just uh, impossible. And uh, a lot of people uh, before and after have, have complained about the same thing. So it's symbolic names. Uh, symbolic names are great for people who know a DSL inside out, for the experts, because they can essentially uh, really reduce uh, the, the time to understand things. Another sim uh, DSL that we all understand very well, that we th probably wouldn't want to see without symbolic names, is parser combinators, where we write uh, 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 an or, or a double or, a triple or, or something like that, triple bar for the alternative. And of course, we see immediately, well, that's an alternative, because that essentially comes from the context-free syntax. But a lot of people have complained about it from the community at large, who says, well, this is completely, I don't know what this does. And, and then I can't Google for it, and I don't find it. So typically, uh, hmm? Yes, that is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's actually a proposal, which I think is, is quite reasonable to say, to force everyone to have uh, given an alphanumeric name with every symbolic identifier. Because first, it is a good discipline to say, well, what should we call this thing? Uh, we don't want to call it twiddle bang or something like that. And, and secondly, that's something you can Google. So, so I think that, that would, would make sense and address this issue to some degree. OK, so the other story to be careful was the story of SBT. So SBT was called simple build tool, and now it's only called Scala build tool because people find it anything but simple anymore. <laughs> uh, so, and in fact, SBT has changed a lot. Uh, so there was a version up to SBT 07, and that was essentially a Scala library to write programs that do builds. And it was very obvious. So essentially, a setting was just a field and some class, and you would mix things together with traits. And so it used Scala quite directly. So to just say, well, I express, I have a Scala, normal Scala program. It, it, it expresses my build. And uh, this library would just give essentially the necessary components to do that. Uh, SPT uh, 10 or 010 was essentially some a completely new beast. So it was essentially a new language, which very, which was very cleverly embedded in Scala. So what it did did is, is essentially it defined a global map of settings and tasks, uh, and those settings and uh, built essentially manipulated these settings and tasks in with a way with with a set of combinators and things like that. Um, the Problems with that is the manipulation is actually done in an imperative way, uh, strangely enough. The syntax at the time was somewhat weird. 
And the third problem was that it was really hard to debug because now you program at arm's length. Before you could say, well, what's the flow? You could go in a debugger and you could trace this thing. So now it's sort of this map. Uh, so you can't just have a watch point of a variable and say, when, when does this variable get set? Because this thing is essentially an entry in this big hash map and typically your tools are much, much worse to actually deal with that. So here's an example SPT program. It's actually uh, an SPT uh, part which is, uh, has been uh, cited as Stack Overflow is a particular good one, so something people learn from. Uh, so what you have here is you have these settings and then uh, you essentially add a bunch of stuff uh, to that by uh, essentially manipulating all these uh, entries here. And I guess the scary bit is if you look at the operator, so there's a colon equals and there's a less less equals, a plus plus equals. Uh, yeah, that's it here. There, there are actually a couple more. So, so if you come new to a build and it says, understand that build, and I guess your first question would be, well, what is, what is this? That, that's probably assignment. I can probably figure, out, figure that out. But what the heck is this? Or that. So that probably, if you know Scala, you also know that's probably uh, append to a sequence somewhere. But that, I, I would have no idea. And there, there are more operators like that. So that violates the principle that you say, well, in particular for a build that probably everyone should see, everybody should understand. OK, here's another story, caveat story about macros. So in Scala 2.10, we got experimental macros. And uh, a lot of people got very excited about that. Uh, in particular, because these macros were very powerful. They could invoke arbitrary Scala and Java code during compilation. Just going through the reflective interface, you could call out to arbitrary code. Uh, so the frameworks, the designers of the play, play framework had a really clever idea. They said, well, we can write a macro that automatically validates a query against the database schema. So then we know that the query is correct relative to, to, to the schema directly, without actually having to do any setup or boilerplate or things like that. So when you see a query, the macro got a query, it went to the database, got the schema, validates the query against it. What could possibly go wrong with that? What could go wrong? Well, the thing that could go wrong is that in an IDE, the type checker is run on every keystroke. So every keystroke, you run the type checker again. So what happens now in every keystroke is the macro expansion happens, you go out to the database, you get the you get the schema, you validate against the schema. So your IDE, of course, slows to a crawl. So, so IDEs become completely useless with that thing. The problem with that is, of course, that the, the, pro the designers of, the, of Play, they don't use an IDE, they don't need that. They use Sublime Text or Emacs or whatever. Uh, but a lot of other people do, and essentially everything is interconnected here. So that's, that's another tricky thing. So I, I guess the, the lesson to, to, to remember here is you really need to consider the tooling for the DSLs. Okay, the other, the, the, the last problem that, that for that I use Slick. So Slick is a database connectivity layer for Scala. Essentially lets data be expressed as Scala case classes that correspond to the database schema and it lets queries be expressed with four expressions, uh, so which translate then to map, flat map and filter, essentially monads. So uh, the problems here uh, are that sometimes you have really long compilation times and that's due that essentially there's an automatic encoding of the database schema into essentially a very precise type system using age lists and age maps. If you don't know what that is, that's essentially a way to have heterogeneous lists where every element of the list can have a different type and the system keeps track of all of these things. They're not native in Scala, but you can code them up using implicits and type level folds and whatnot. Uh, but the problem is sometimes the encodings are very complex and uh, the complex encodings can lead to exp essentially exploding implicit searches, which can lead to very, very slow compile times. And the other problem here was that error messages for type errors involving schemas became really hairy because you have all these complex encodings and now something goes wrong and essentially you see the error message as a result of your encoding. So for me, some of the research directions in uh, DSLs would be uh, a non-exclusive list, but three points that I think would interest me particularly would be the first one, how do we balance expressiveness and uniformity? So how can we somehow avoid this sort of everybody going in a different direction that they find is great but other people find horrible? Uh, how we, can we restrict the capabilities of DSLs? Uh, 
So there, if you take, let's say, Spark as an example, uh, Spark needs to restrict the capability of your DSL because everything runs in parallel on many nodes. But what if you actually used side effects here? So when would you know, who would tell you that essentially that's not something that's compatible with, with your embedded DSL? And the last one would be how can we ensure DS that DSL tooling, uh, that means error diagnostics, ID experience, debugging, is as good for the as for the host language. So to come to the contents of this program then. So in the, in the school here, I think we have assembled a set of talks that essentially talk about two things. Uh, the first thing is platforms. So we're going to see a number of different ways to define and implement DSLs, be it standalone, be it as embedded DSLs of a host language. Uh, and the other part of the program is essentially we ways to express or exploit domain knowledge for doing essentially things that you can't do with a normal programming language. That could be performance, for instance, uh, leveraging domain-specific knowledge to get faster programs, or new targets, so good techniques to translate DSL code to non-standard targets. What we have seen, what we will see here in the program is essentially this here. So there are 10 talks. Uh, and uh, they are essentially fo fall sometimes in one and sometimes in the other uh, ca category. We can just do it interactively and see where things would fit. So we have the platforms, we have the performance, so essentially exploiting domain-specific knowledge for getting better performance, and we have the new targets categories. So we'll start today with uh, Ilko Visser's talk, and I think that's, oops, yeah, let me just, now we have to, uh, I have to do this, uh, got, got it, okay. And that, I think, uh, so, so that's clearly a platform talk, I think. Um, then we have quoted DSLs, another platform talk. Then we have DSL embedding in Scala. I guess that's another platform talk. Uh, DSL embedding in Racket, you guessed it. Oops. Uh, no, no. Ah. ah, okay. Uh, it's hard to do PowerPoint and talk at the same time. Okay. <laughs> Good, should shut up. <laughs> <laughs> OK, DSL embedding in Haskell. So all these things are platform talks. Uh, then we have a talk by Christoph on exploiting domain-specific knowledge for, for databases and data analytics. And Christoph, I think you argue that's about both performance and new targets. Would that be right? Mostly performance. Mostly performance? OK. Uh, then we have uh, Spiral by Markus and, uh, and um, Georg, um, and that's about performance. Uh, heterogeneous computing, and I guess that's Kuhnle, uh, also about performance. Dynamic compilation, where do we put that? That's Thomas Wörtinger, uh, and he's talking about the truffle system uh, that essentially lets you express uh, domain-specific languages directly on the JVM. That's, in a sense, it's a platform, and it's, I guess it's about performance, so what would you say, Tiak? Yeah. So that's, that's probably both. I mean, you can have more than one uh, tag for each uh, thing. And uh, reconfigurable computing, that's Jonathan. Uh, that I, I want to have at least one for new targets, so that has to be new targets, because that, that goes to FPGAs. Um, any other labels that we should put in here? You should put the green label back on embedding in Rack. Oh, yes. I think you can also put a performance bash on the Scala talk. OK. Now we get open the floodgates. Okay. New targets for heterogeneous computing. Yeah. Are GPUs new targets? Yeah, they are. That's right. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, new targets. 
Okay, so that gives you a rough outline of what, what will come in the rest of the week. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have Markus and uh, Tiak talk about the, both the platforms and the exploiting domain-specific knowledge categories. And I think we start with Tiak for the platforms because the, the earlier talks in this session are all about platforms. Okay, thank you.